Hello everybody. In this section we present fuel cell efficiency and power output. We will have a number of topics, theoretic efficiency, practical fuel cell efficiencies, effect of concentration, power output and polarization curve. And in these uh, sections we will have integrated a number of exercises. To the first topic, theoretic efficiency. We will present what is energy efficiency, how do different technologies compare and how is it calculated. Uh, first principle, we have to consider the first law of thermodynamics, which says energy cannot be invented or disappear. It is always converted from one form to another. And this is what something that happens on everyday basis. And we use it every day from batteries to electricity, solar to heat and so forth. The efficiency says, in fact, uh, is the ratio between uh, what you get out and what you put in. All right. I have this here, what you put in and what you get out, more or less. In more quantitative terms, we often use the heat-driven engines as a benchmark for fuel cells. And uh, the efficiency of a, a heat-driven engine is expressed by the Carnot efficiency and is depending on the difference between the hot and the cold temperature, as expressed in this equation. When you plot this, Carnot efficiency versus the temperature. There are three curves here, and they represent three cases for the cold temperature. One when the cold temperature is 25 degrees, one for 100, and one for 200 degrees centigrade. What you observe is that, of course, the efficiency increases with increase in temperature. So you have to go to fairly high temperatures to uh, achieve a high efficiency. And number two, it increases the colder the cold temperature is. But you have to observe that if you have a, a, a heat-driven combustion engine, that you have to maybe cool, which also requires energy, to come to temperatures as low as 25 degrees centigrade. So what you learn from here is high temperatures are preferred in uh, heat-driven engines and low cold temperatures are preferred. Now the theoretic efficiencies of a fuel cell. There we actually uh, have to uh, uh, look at a different equation. That is the obtainable work expressed as the Gibbs free energy. Uh, yeah, related to the energy that I put in. And this can be expressed as the heat of combustion. So that is actually the heat that would be released if I just uh, combust the fuel. If you take the uh, simple case of the uh, reaction of hydrogen with oxygen in a fuel cell, you obtain uh, the curves here for efficiency again versus temperature. When you remember the Carnot process, you see that high efficiencies can already achi be achieved at lower temperatures, which is um, often a good, uh, a good situation because all the materials that are involved are not exposed so to very high temperatures and can often uh, uh, hold for, for longer lifetimes. There are also two curves. One is the related to the combustion, heat of combustion, uh, the higher heating value and the lower heating value. And the difference is that uh, uh, the higher heating value, you obtain uh, um, the steam as in the beginning, so in the liquid state. And then for the lower heating value, you have the steam present as in the vapor phase. So the, the take-home message is that fuel cells already deliver high electrical efficiencies at lower temperatures. And uh, in particular, compared to Carnot uh, efficiencies, this is an advantage because you don't need to go to very high temperatures and you can use cheaper system materials. From uh, the theoretic efficiency, of course, there are always some, uh, some uh, obstacles that you, uh, in a practical case, you uh, often obtain lower uh, fuel, uh, yeah, fuel cell efficiencies. And here we go through uh, the topics, how does this relate to the theoretic efficiency and what uh, processes have to be considered. First, uh, we uh, talked about the obtainable work, um, the Gibbs free energy. And this is uh, shown here how it relates to the 
cell voltage or the reversible voltage uh, from uh, the fuel cell. It's a theoretical value. Uh, the real cell voltage is always lower. As soon as you start to draw a current from the fuel cell, the voltage will be lower than the reversible voltage shown in the first equation. So you get a kind of a cell voltage efficiency. Now when you draw a current, so you operate the fuel cell, there is an ideal uh, correlation between the, the current and the moles you set in, the fuel you provide. And this is uh, uh, shown here by Faraday's law. This is the ideal case. But in the real case, you will always have a, a smaller current in comparison to the ideal current. So the efficiency is also lowered by the uh, current efficiency. And finally, you will never be able to completely convert the fuel you submit. There will always be uh, or has to be also a remaining part of fuel in the outlet of the fuel cell, so uh, this can be expressed by the fuel utilization. So you only use a part of the fuel up to uh, fuel 95 to 98 percent typically. So here you see three terms, efficiencies, and they will be added. So in reality the fuel cell efficiency is the theoretic efficiency uh, times these uh, uh, voltage, current, and fuel utilization efficiencies. I now go to the effect of concentration. Because you have uh, reactants and you have products, you will never have a, complete, uh, com a completed reaction. There will be uh, equilibrium. So how is that related to the uh, fuel cell voltage and performance? We again go to the most simple case of a reaction of hydrogen with oxygen to form uh, water. And here the uh, effect of the concentration of the reactants, water, uh, reactants uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and the product water can be uh, expressed in this uh, kind of, uh, uh, yeah, in the Nernst equation. So you have a theoretic voltage and then a, a term which is dependent on the uh, correlate or the ratio between the uh, reactants to the product. So you will always have an effect of the concentration of, uh, on, on the cell voltage as well. Here the activities are given. This is the most correct term. Uh, however, it is often difficult to determine. So uh, in, in practical, for practical calculations, you often use uh, partial pressures or concentrations. Power output. Here we uh, want to answer the question, how much power can a fuel cell deliver? And how are efficiency and uh, power output related to each other? First, the very basic equation. The power is the current times voltage. If I now plot the cell voltage versus the current and the power versus the current, you see these uh, three lines. The red line is the electromotive force, it's the theoretic cell voltage, which you only have when you don't operate the fuel cell. As soon as you operate the fuel cell, you come to the green curve. The cell voltage is decreasing with increasing current. And uh, of course, in, uh, correlated uh, through the equation I showed before, the power is increasing and going through a maximum with increasing current. That means there is a optimum uh, range where I can draw the maximum power of the fuel cell. When we uh, remember the first equations uh, relating to the efficiency, we saw that the efficiency is highest as uh, the, the higher the cell voltage is. So here, actually, we would prefer to go to lower current densities to achieve the highest possible efficiency. Here, this has to uh, be matched and a trade-off has to be found between the power that I want to extract in watt, kilowatt, towards the uh, electrical efficiency. This uh, uh, correlation here, IV curves, power curves, are closely related to the next topic, polarization curve. Here I will shortly introduce uh, how the um, elementary steps in a fuel cell contribute to the overall fuel cell process and how we can identify what processes are happening at what uh, time in the fuel cell. Here there is an illustration of a fuel cell which has the electrolyte, cathode and anode, and uh, very, uh, yeah, very roughly sketched the, the overall processes. 
There are many more and the overall fuel cell process is the sum of all elementary steps. For example, the electrolyte has in, uh, to conduct ions and can uh, be seen or considered like a resistance. So it will have a certain ohmic resistance towards this ionic transport. On the electrodes, on the other hand, we know there has to be a catalytic reaction that can, be a, a, can have a resistance in itself, so the activity can be impeded. The electrodes, they, are, they have to provide the gases, so there has to be porosity, so there could be transport resistances and at different levels from the gas phase closer to the interface in larger pores, smaller pores. So there is uh, there's a, a large number of elementary steps that play together and which all in themselves can contribute to the overall resistance. And this overall resistance of the cell is expressed by the term uh, shown on the upper right, the area specific resistance. This is the theoretic voltage minus the measured uh, voltage divided by the current. And of course, the aim is to have this resistance as small as possible. That can be uh, very nicely illustrated again in this curve, in this polarization curve, where we plot the cell voltage versus the current. Again, the ideal voltage where no current is obtained or no resistances occur, this is the red uh, horizontal line. In reality, we will always have the uh, kind of a green line shape where we have a first part, initial part, with uh, lower current densities. This is called the activation impedance. Uh, there we see uh, how active the electrodes are. So the steeper here the loss or the, the slope is, the uh, less active the um, respective electrodes are for the um, oxidation and reduction reaction. Then we have actually, when we increase the current even further, we see a kind of linear range, which corresponds to kind of ohmic losses. And then when we increase the current even more, the curve bends down, and which corresponds to gas transport losses. So we actually have a lack of fuel at the interfaces where the oxidation and reduction occur. So this is a typical polarization curve. And what can we do? Of course, we want to reduce the area-specific resistance, so the green curve comes closer to the red curve. And that we can do by different means. We can develop the electrodes to give them more activity, so the first uh, slope is not as steep. We can increase the conductivity of the electrolyte, so then the, also this slope becomes more flat. And the gas transport, we can provide the uh, optimum pores for the gas to be transported to and from the reaction sites. And in that way, we can also avoid the spending at the uh, early current density.